Before we get started, I'm just gonna let you know that I will not be acknowledging any of the Spider-Man sequels. I will be solely talking about the first installments as if the sequels hadn't existed, so this way we can fairly compare them as standalone films. So with that said, it's time to find out which of these first three Spider-Man installments is the best and which one is the worst. Let the battle commence. Now the important story elements I want to focus on is Peter Parker's motivation for becoming the web-slinging hero we all know and love, and that motivation just so happens to be the death of his Uncle Ben. Both the 2002 and 2012 movies handled this storyline differently, and what I personally loved about the execution from the original movie is that Peter could have prevented it. But for understandable, yet selfish reasons, he didn't. So it makes sense as to why he feels guilty and how this would mentally have a negative impact on him. Not to mention that his uncle's death was relatable, I mean, any one of us can stumble upon our loved ones like this. And when this Uncle Ben died, you cared. It was handled incredibly well, and watching Peter and his aunt grieve over his death was wonderfully done. Not to mention that Uncle Ben's death was not a tired plot point at this time. That was until The Amazing Spider-Man had a go at it, and boy did it suck. First of all, this Uncle Ben is an awful person. Uncle Ben is meant to be a father figure and mentor to Peter, but he's also supposed to encompass the fun qualities of a father too. And in Raimi's Spider-Man, he has that. In The Amazing Spider-Man, however, all he does is lecture him. I mean, seriously, there is not a single nice and memorable scene between the two of them, and even when Peter gets back at a bully without resorting to violence, Uncle Ben tells him off about that too. Did you humiliate that boy? Yeah, Peter, did you humiliate that boy? The same boy who picked on a little kid and punched you in the face Fight Club style. According to your uncle, how freaking dare you? Honestly, I don't get what his problem is. I mean, if it was my kid, I would be happy that he managed to get the bully back without resorting to his fists. That's no easy feat, but no, he sees it as, damn, what is wrong with this boy? On top of that, when this Uncle Ben dies, I didn't give a shit. Why? Because the robber didn't kill him, he killed himself. Watch. The robber very kindly actually helps Peter out and gives him his... <clears throat> milk, runs out of the store, trips over, and his gun falls out. Now keep in mind, this is New York, firearms are legal here, so practically anyone can be carrying them around, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to use them. So now that you know that, what does Uncle Ben do when he sees a random person drop one? I mean, I don't know what to say. This guy was clearly on the run, he wasn't going to shoot anyone unless they gave him a reason to. So yeah, this Uncle Ben is a moron, and it is so shocking as to how contrived his death scene was. And because it's his own fault, you couldn't care less about his death. He brought it on himself. In the Raimi movie, his death seemed natural, and you felt bad for both him and Peter. Instead of being sad for Garfield's Peter, I just found myself laughing. And that's primarily because of the contrived way the movie sets up Uncle Ben's death, and also because listening to Garfield cry is also pretty funny. So Peter's motivation for becoming Spider-Man via his Uncle Ben's death is here, but it's really shaky. Now in Spider-Man Homecoming, seeing as they smartly skipped the origin story, this is the movie where we were supposed to see Tom Holland's Peter Parker dealing with the aftermaths of his uncle's death. But unfortunately we don't even get a mention of him. No, seriously. The movie instead thinks it's more important to focus on people finding his Aunt May attractive. I mean, what the hell is wrong with you, Marvel? This movie had the perfect time and opportunity for us to see this Peter deal with the loss of his uncle. We don't need to see it happen again, we just need to see him deal with it. But, big shock, Marvel blew their chance to include more jokes. And consequentially, it significantly reduces the impact of anything Uncle Ben related in the future. Because after ignoring and not acknowledging him throughout this entire movie, they can't just suddenly bring him up and get all sad in the future. That's bad storytelling. It will be so odd and out of place because, you know, it was supposed to be discussed in this movie. And without his Uncle Ben's death driving and motivating him, the only reason Tom Holland's Spider-Man wants to be a hero is because it's cool and because he wants to be an Avenger. Talk about stripping a great character of his arc and motivation and dumbing it down to the most simplest of stories. Now, we will talk about the villain of the stories later, but for now, with regards to how these movies establish their own Spider-Man's motivation, the Raimi movie is by far the superior origin story, followed by Amazing Spider-Man and finally Homecoming. Now, before he becomes Spider-Man, Peter Parker is meant to be a nerd, he's meant to be a loser. And to this day, the popular opinion is that Tobey Maguire absolutely owns Nerdy Parker. 
You just look at this guy and you can tell that he wouldn't stand a chance. And once he gets bitten by the spider and is mostly done being the nerd, he becomes a playful yet more mature version of the Peter Parker we know from the comics, and the emotional arc he goes through gives him an effective and much needed depth. So that's my two pence on Maguire. What about Andrew Garfield? Well, the movie opens with him at school and it tries hard to make Andrew Garfield look like a loser. Too hard. And that's the problem. When you look at Garfield, he comes off as a guy who would be either the normal or popular kid. Nothing about him screams nerd or outcast, and making him put on a pair of glasses isn't going to change that. As for his performance after he gets bitten by the spider, it's good. I mean, uh, I definitely enjoy watching it, but it's just a standard portrayal and there's nothing particularly special about it. Now the one you have all been waiting for, what do I think of Tom Holland's portrayal as Peter Parker? Well first off, I really like the fact that Marvel actually cast a kid. Both Tobey Maguire and especially Andrew Garfield were well into their 20s when they were cast, but Holland is in his mid-teens, and that's perfectly fitting because that makes him the exact same age as the character he's playing, and as a result, his behaviour and mannerisms reflect that. Although I gotta say, I did find him to be quite irritating at times. Also, as I stated earlier in my story segment, Tom Holland's Peter Parker does not have to come to grips with any of his problems, and that seriously deprives him of any character depth. Now, quite a few people are saying that they don't like the fact that Peter Parker is a young kid in this version, but I personally think that's what's so great about it. As more sequels get made, Tom Holland is going to age with his character, so if Marvel gets their act together with regards to storytelling, then we will see this Peter Parker grow from a teenager into a man. But the lack of his motivation and arc really does make Holland's Peter Parker lack any depth, and as a result, he feels incomplete. So out of the three, the best one is Tobey Maguire, followed by Tom Holland, and finally, Andrew Garfield. Much like his Peter Parker, Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man is definitely more mature, but thankfully he does incorporate a good amount of humour, and when things get serious, he takes the situation seriously. Also, out of all the live-action Spider-Mans we've had, Maguire's costume by far is the best. It looks the most accurate to the classic costume of the time, as well as the 90s cartoon that I grew up watching. Do I have any complaints with him? Well, one. And the severity of this complaint really comes down to personal preference. Despite having humour sprinkled throughout the movie, this Spider-Man is not as playful as the character is meant to be, and that is ultimately the biggest problem people have with Maguire's interpretation. How do I feel about it? Well, I see the problem, but honestly, it doesn't bother me. This Spider-Man definitely feels like his own version whilst keeping the core of the character intact. And honestly, because he isn't as playful, I feel like I can connect with him a lot more and even take him seriously. So Maguire's Spider-Man I think is a great incarnation. What about Andrew Garfield's interpretation? Well, Garfield's is more of a traditional Spider-Man. He is funnier and has been given more jokes and playful dialogue, and his attitude is a lot lighter, whereas you could always just feel that Maguire's Spider-Man had more weight on his shoulders. Again, whether you like that or not, all comes down to personal preference. As for problems, I only really have one, and that is that Garfield's Spider-Man is too simple. It feels like there is an important character trait missing whenever I see him on screen. He needs to be a little more complex, because as is, he feels very much like a diet Spider-Man. But then again, should Spider-Man be more complex, or is this just the right amount of depth? Hmm. Wait for my conclusion to this segment and you'll find out the answer as to which of the two I prefer. And finally, what do I think of Tom Holland's Spider-Man? Well, to be honest, I really did not like him at all. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Now let me just say that when I saw him for the first time in Captain America Civil War, I thought he was perfect as both Spider-Man and Peter Parker. In fact, I would dare say that in a short amount of screen time, his portrayal as both characters was the best, even better than Maguire and Garfield. But in Homecoming, his Spider-Man feels like a completely different character. He's annoying, doesn't shut the hell up, and all his jokes sucked. Now I don't blame Tom Holland for this at all. As far as I'm concerned, he has proved himself as a perfect Peter Parker and Spider-Man in Civil War. But in Homecoming, the way he was directed and his poorly written dialogue is what really let him down. Not to mention that the movie completely forgot to incorporate his spider sense. I mean seriously, it was so frustrating to see people appear behind him without him even realising. Also, do you remember when I said that Maguire's Spider-Man costume looked the best? Well, to be honest, Tom Holland's costume in essence should look better since we have come a long way since 2002, but the reason it doesn't is because it looks fake. In every single shot, it doesn't look real. Now sometimes they use CGI like in this shot, but even when it is the actual costume, it still looks like CGI. And every time I see Holland Spider-Man on screen, he doesn't look real, and that really is distracting. And am I the only one who finds it ironic that despite being the newest Spider-Man, he looks the most fake? 
So yeah, in my opinion, Homecoming made a big mess of the character. So this one is really tough. I like Mature Spider-Man, but ultimately from best to worst is Garfield Spider-Man, which is very closely followed by Maguire's, and finally, Tom Holland's. Let's quickly talk about the lizard from Amazing Spider-Man, and I'm just gonna say it, he sucks. I remember when the trailers for Amazing Spider-Man came out, and instead of admiring and enjoying the comic book character in all his live-action glory, I was completely bored of him. I'm not saying it was devoid of having any effort put into it, but it's just a very dull design. If they made it more like the comic with the elongated mouth, then that would be a more interesting visual to look at. As is, it just looks too human, and making that alteration was a big mistake. And when I get bored of looking at him just by the trailer, then you know something is wrong. The only aspect of the villain that could have been interesting is Dr. Kurt Connors. He wants to grow his hand back, and this could have been a really heartfelt character motivation, but it wasn't. The movie makes no attempt to really dig in and even remotely realize his disability. However, there is a deleted scene where he talks to his son and he wants to become a full committed father again, and it was an effective scene. But unfortunately, it was deleted for some reason, so it doesn't count. So the lizard is a boring character and could have been far better. Now in Spider-Man Homecoming, we have Vulture, played by Michael I'm Batman Keaton. Now out of all the villains from the Marvel Cinematic Universe's rogues gallery, Keaton is the only one that is actually good. He's not a big mastermind, he doesn't have crazy superpowers, he is just a normal guy who is cleaning up the mess that the Avengers have made so he can make a living for his family. However, someone, guess who, takes that away from him and as a result, Michael Keaton's character decides to take matters into his own hands. Now Keaton is not in the movie a whole lot, but he's in here enough. And by far, the scene that I will always remember is when he's talking to Peter in the car and threatens him. This scene was so awesome, and is pretty much the only part of the entire movie that had genuine tension. Now when Keaton gets in the Vulture costume, things become less interesting to me as I really am not a fan of that gas mask. But at the same time, he's not shown in it a whole lot, so I never really got bored. But on the whole, Michael Keaton was an awesome bad guy, and he really does elevate all his dialogue and material which would be very flat in the hands of other actors. Now having said that, I am still going to give the edge to the Green Goblin from the 2002 movie. Why? Well that's because in Spider-Man Homecoming, Marvel gave Michael Keaton balls only to take them away from him. For example, there was a scene where he incinerates one of his own thugs, and it perfectly would have showcased his transition into a bad guy. But then, the movie follows it up with a silly joke where he says, Oh, I thought this was the anti-gravity gun. I mean, what the hell? This really is my problem with Marvel. It seems like they are too afraid to allow a scene to have an impact with their audience, so they just force another joke which completely castrates the moment. And it's because of this I feel like as good as a villain Michael Keaton is, he was shamefully not able to reach his full potential. All because Marvel couldn't hold back with their bloody jokes. Now the reason why I prefer the Green Goblin is because as well as being memorable as all hell, he is the perfect villain for this incarnation of Spider-Man. Whenever you see him on screen, he strangely works within this movie's established tone, even with that cheap-ass costume. Also, despite his over-the-top character traits, the jokes in the movie don't compromise his character, whereas as I stated earlier, they did for Keaton. And his final encounter and battle with Spider-Man is by far one of the most memorable and effective scenes in Spider-Man history. Now yes, he does get rather silly at times and the costume really isn't doing him any favours, and although it doesn't destroy the character, it does stand out like a pitchfork to the eye. Especially when you take a look at the prototype of the original mask they would have used, but they didn't for some unknown reason. So the movie with the best villains is Raimi Spider-Man, followed very closely by Spider-Man Homecoming, and finally, The Amazing Spider-Man. In Spider-Man Homecoming, the action is good, but it's actually gone down in my estimation since my original review. With the Raimi Spider-Man, I could recall every single action scene as they were creative, had great setups, and they had a certain intense nature about them. There were stakes, and the movie keeps you guessing as to how Spider-Man will win the fight. I would even say you get that feeling with The Amazing Spider-Man to a certain extent. But with Spider-Man Homecoming, since the stakes and intense tone is nowhere to be found, and the fact that this Spider-Man always looks like CGI, these action scenes also come across as completely fake. And they're not brutal enough like the other two films to keep you on the edge of your seat as to how our hero is going to win. Now that being said, in Homecoming I still think the action has a really good sense of impact and showcases Spider-Man's strength better than the last two films, but that doesn't escape the fact that on top of what I already said, they are so unbelievably forgettable. Every Spider-Man movie, including the universally hated ones, all had memorable action sequences, but Homecoming does not. 
Now, with regards to Amazing Spider-Man, the action scenes are well shot and choreographed, but the only underwhelming thing about them is the locations they take place in. For example, the sewer is an incredibly boring place to see these two fight, if you even want to call this scene a fight. And even the rooftop scene was quite a mediocre setting too. The only action scene that I thought was pretty much perfect was the school fight. Both characters used their environment to their advantage, it was fast paced, and again, wonderfully shot. But the problem is, this is the only action scene that I enjoyed from beginning to end. The rest of the action in Amazing Spider-Man is pretty mediocre. In Raimi Spider-Man, some of the fights are starting to look a little dated, but on the whole, they are still entertaining and really well done. I mean, pretty much everything we see is happening in camera, whereas the other two movies rely heavily on CGI. And what many agree is the best action scene in the entire movie is the final fight between Spider-Man and the Green Goblin. The music, the absolutely raw, brutal, and super realistic punching sounds and severe injuries inflicted on both characters really makes this an intense scene. Prior to this, many adults associated Spider-Man as being the superhero character that is meant for kids. I remember my parents thinking the exact same thing, but this scene cemented it to all of us that Spider-Man is actually more than just a kid's film. And to this day, this to me is one of the best climactic fights between two comic book characters. So the films with the better action is Raimi Spider-Man, followed by The Amazing Spider-Man, and finally, Spider-Man Homecoming. Now the tone for each of these films couldn't be more different. The tone for Spider-Man is goofy whilst it simultaneously tries to balance some serious overtones. And boy, it really drops the goofiness at times and becomes insanely serious. Now following the success of Nolan's Dark Knight movies, The Amazing Spider-Man tried to go for a much darker tone. And even though you wouldn't consider Spider-Man a particularly dark character, it surprisingly worked. Now keep in mind, at the time, we didn't know just how bad a light-hearted source material could have become with a darker tone. But now that we do, I have to give some overdue compliments to the movie for at least being able to pull off the dark tone while simultaneously maintaining a somewhat joyful atmosphere. The movie even takes the opportunity to sprinkle in a few jokes, and much like Raimi's Spider-Man, it's not thrown in your face and it feels natural. I will say that the comedy is much more subtle in this movie though. The only time it tries to be more direct with its humour is when Spider-Man stops this car thief. Now that being said, the movie does feel dull at times, and heck, there are even moments where it feels joyless. But the darker tone does work most of the time, and you eventually get used to it. Now it's time to talk about the tone for Spider-Man Homecoming. Well, surprisingly, the tone is actually more childish than all the other Marvel movies combined, and that is saying something. And that really is a big problem for the movie, as it completely flushes all the tension that this film could have greatly benefited from down the toilet. Now, as I stated earlier, the most memorable scene of the movie is when Vulture was threatening Peter. And do you know why the scene was great? It's because it had tension, and it started to introduce some darkness and stakes for our main character. But about a minute after the scene was over, the typical Marvel tone takes over and the movie becomes childish again. On top of that, the humour only drags the film's tone down to the dumps even more, and it doesn't only compromise the tone of this movie, it also takes a hit at the characters. Peter's friend Ned, for example, is clearly meant to speak for us, the audience, but he's just obnoxiously played for laughs. And he even mentions porn as a frickin' joke, and it wasn't even funny. Also, I didn't say it in my review, but MJ here was the worst part of this movie's humour. She was just acting like a depressed emo the whole time. She also constantly says weird stuff, like... I can't believe you guys are at this lame party. You're here too. Am I? What the hell was that? She really did annoy the shit out of me. Now, whichever tone you prefer is really down to personal preference, but in my opinion, from best to worst is Spider-Man, The Amazing Spider-Man, and finally, Spider-Man Homecoming. Rather than being made as competent and necessary films, The Amazing Spider-Man and Spider-Man Homecoming both feel like they were made with an agenda in mind. And they were. The Amazing Spider-Man was only made so Sony could retain the rights to the character, and Homecoming was made just so Marvel could say, look, we have Spider-Man back. As far as an actual movie goes, one feels contrived and the other feels disingenuous and hollow. Whereas on the other side of the spectrum, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man felt like it was setting out to be a standalone movie. It set up an arc for our hero, and by the time the film was over, there was a definitive progression, with plenty left open for a sequel. On top of that, it felt like it knew what it was doing and was put together more coherently and had much more dependable people working on it. It felt like a passion project, and moviegoers around the world responded to it incredibly well. Now, for the sake of time, there was some stuff I didn't even talk about, such as the romance, which was the best in The Amazing Spider-Man, practically non-existent in Homecoming, and it was the worst in Raimi's. 
The music, which was acceptable in The Amazing Spider-Man, although it did have some truly awesome moments, it was absolutely fantastic in Raimi's Spider-Man, as composer Danny Elfman was still in his prime at the time, and it was absolutely forgettable and downright disposable in Homecoming, with the exception of the modernized 60s theme. Additionally, with Spider-Man Homecoming, I went in with super low expectations, and somehow, the movie still disappointed me. It just felt so standard and childish. So childish, in fact, that a more appropriate title would be to call it Disney's Spider-Man. And do you know what? Out of all of the Spider-Man movies, I'm glad that I've seen them at least once. Even the bad ones. But Homecoming is the only one where I feel like if I had skipped it, I wouldn't have missed out on much. But that being said, this movie did accomplish the impossible to me. It actually made me appreciate the work that went into The Amazing Spider-Man, and on top of that, it made me raise its score. That is an amazing feat, as I really hated this movie for so long. But Homecoming made me realize that it could have been much worse. It's time for the scores. Sam Raimi's Spider-Man gets an 8 out of 10, The Amazing Spider-Man has now got a higher score of 5 out of 10, and Spider-Man Homecoming takes its place at a 3 out of 10. <sighs> this has been exhausting, and I know I am undoubtedly going to piss a bunch of you off, but this is my show, and hence you are going to hear my honest opinions as well as my comparisons. Just keep in mind that if you disagree with me, then that's perfectly fine. We are all entitled to our own opinions, and I am entitled to mine. And I never compromise my viewpoints just to please the masses. So, that's it for another Versus episode, guys. Please do give this video a thumbs up if you liked it, and remember to share it too so more people can be aware of the show. Thanks so much for watching, and I will catch all of you next time. Take care.